Any discussion of politics requires a, an examination of the backdrop against which the game is being played today. You and I are fairly conscious of the issues of our times, I presume. We know that we're faced with questions of the Cold War, economic growth, unemployment, the value of our money, and so on. But I sometimes think the greatest issue of our times is completely overlooked. It underlies all these others because it's the issue of man versus the state, individual freedom versus society's rights. Man's been thinking about this since his very earliest days. This was a factor in our own constitutional convention in this country, and it remains with us till this very day. I'm not sure whether you know it or not, but not everyone is convinced that man is capable of being free. George Bernard Shaw, in the second act of Man and Superman, wrote a rather remarkable line. He said, liberty means responsibility. That's why most men dread it. Shaw himself was among those people completely convinced that the human of the species lacks the responsibility to be free. And perhaps it was because of this that in the year of 1883, he joined with a group of intellectuals in London in a series of meetings that are consequential to our very times. The purpose of this series of meetings was to radically change the direction of British society. Perhaps the radical change was called for because England of those days lived with some very severe social problems. It's a great amount of unemployment. There were mills in which children were at work. Misery abounded. Shaw and his friends, having had some experience with the capitalist system, were convinced that capitalism had failed. They'd become somewhat intrigued by the ideas of a man named Karl Marx, who held that the state had to do the planning for all the component members thereof. Now, while this group of intellectuals agreed with Marx on basic economic theory, they had one very serious disagreement with him. And that was over the method of implementation of the idea that we know today as socialism. Marx, you may recall, preached the doctrine of revolution. Workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. To the group of British intellectuals, the idea of revolution seemed wasteful of human resources. And so these people sought a, a subtler method through which they might implement socialism in England. During the course of one of their meetings, as they discussed this need for a subtle technique, one of their members, and we're not quite sure which one, told the group a story out of ancient history, and perhaps you remember this from your high school studies. The story of the Second Punic War and specifically the challenge to the Roman Empire by the Carthaginians under the leadership of Hannibal. Remember Hannibal? He revolutionized warfare by coming across the Alps with elephants as his chief armament. And now he stood on the very plains north of Rome, threatening the heart of the Roman Empire. Rome was under the control, under the leadership of a man named Maximus Quintus Fabius. And one thing that might be said for Fabius, he was intelligent enough not to fight Hannibal on Hannibal's terms and on Hannibal's battleground. 
He recognized that if he led the Roman legions out onto the plains north of Rome and engaged Hannibal in a frontal attack, he'd probably be defeated. And so Fabius worked out a method of warfare revolutionary for his times. Rejecting the idea of frontal attack, he, he chose instead to fight Hannibal through indirection, gradualism, bits and pieces. And utilizing this method, he gave additional centuries to the Roman Empire. Now, as this group of British intellectuals told themselves this story, they excitedly saw the prospect of applying the Fabian method to their specific problem. And before this evening was over, they had formally organized themselves as the Fabian Society of London and agreed on the Fabian tactic as the method they would use to implement socialism in England. Now, this is not quite as simple as it sounds. What they proposed was to bring socialism by evolution rather than revolution. They proposed to go the legislative route. And the moment that you mention legislation, you're talking about control of an organization which can nominate and elect candidates to public office. Such an organization in England and in the United States is called a political party. They took a look at the political structure of Britain of their times and determined that there were two strong parties, the Conservative Party and the Liberal Party, neither of which was vulnerable to what Shaw called permeation. But they noticed also a third group, made up for the most part of radicals, malcontents, people who couldn't find a home in either of the two major parties. And it was into this body that they moved giving it a sense of direction and destiny, a set of precise objectives to be accomplished, motion, peerless leadership. The name of this organization became the Labor Party of England. Now, I won't recount for you the history of the Labor Party and what it's meant to Britain, except to call to your attention that in the year of 1945, the Labor Party, surrounding the nucleus of the Fabian Society, smashed through to a great victory, unseating one of the great men of our times in the prime ministership, Winston Churchill, and bringing to the prime ministership Clement Attlee, a member of the Fabian Society from his early youth. Now you may say, well, what does all this have to do with, with us? Uh, we're Americans. We're somewhat removed from these circumstances. Well, therein lies the tale. For in the year of 1893, an American, a Baptist preacher, by the name of Walter Rauschenbusch, en route to a meeting of theologians in Germany, stopped in London and having heard of the Fabian Society, went and met with them. And became so imbued with this philosophy that he returned to the United States to thereafter preach not only the doctrine of the, of the Baptist sect, but in addition to preach the socialist theology, his contributions to this country in the theological area, I won't go into. But as a practical contribution, he procreated a considerable family, the eldest son of which was a man named H. Stephen Rauschenbusch, who picked up where his father left off. For in the early days of the 20th century, Steve Rauschenbusch helped to found an organization called the Public Ownership League and explained to us the objective of this organization, saying our long-term objective is the abolition of the profit system. To his public ownership league, he attracted a variety of people, some of them notable names in American history, contemporary history, men like Harold Ickes, men like Senator George Norris of Nebraska, men like Jerry Voorhees of the state of California, one-time congressman, now executive director of the Cooperative League of America. A second thread of the transplantation of Fabianism to the United States begins in the year of 1905 when a second American went and visited with the Fabian Society. This one, an ascetic, intense young man, recent graduate of Wesleyan University, named Harry W. Laidler. 
Laidler drank in all the wisdom of the Fabians possible and returned to the United States to work with Clarence Darrow and other people of stature to found an organization called the Intercollegiate Socialist Society. Now, for whatever reason, the Intercollegiate Socialist Society never got off the ground until the year of 1921, when the name of the organization was changed, changed from the Intercollegiate Socialist Society to the League for Industrial Democracy. The literature of the League for Industrial Democracy clearly identifies the organization as the American Fabian Society. Now, you may wonder why I told you this story in the face of my beginning and crystallization of the great issue of our times. The reason is that as the Fabian has developed his ideas in the United States through the League for Industrial Democracy, through its predecessor organization, one very obvious paradox occurs and reoccurs because the Fabian talks constantly about freedom, the word which is most in incidence after freedom is the word control. And I think I need to say little more about the paradox that is implicit in this. Now, are we capable of being free? What's the problem beyond simply this question of freedom? Well, it seems to me that as we look at this issue, we should consider it less a matter of a deep, dark conspiracy of some sort than we should the result of apathy, ineptness, and the default on our responsibilities as individuals. I go back again to Shaw's quote, liberty means responsibility. That's why most men dread it. Now, perhaps you'd like documentary evidence. Evidence from a great mind on the matter of the erosion of liberty as we transfer responsibilities to the state. A question many people have discussed. And in my judgment, the most important book done on this subject is this, a book by a distinguished professor of political science at Duke University, Calvin Hoover. Mr. Hoover throughout this book examines the society of our time, including our own, including the Soviet Russians. And in chapter 12, he begins on the subject of what does the economic system mean to the individual? He begins chapter 12 by saying that the extension of the power of the state over the individual whether or not it is in the best interest of the society, represents a curtailment of personal liberty has generally been considered a truism. He goes on then to say, it has been primarily the advocates of gradual economic reform and the less doctrinaire advocates of socialism who have defended the position that the extension of the powers of the state over the economy does not limit liberty. And then he says, the cumulative effect of such measures might critically endanger liberty without the electorate ever having deliberately considered, much less voted upon, the desirability of statization of the economy. That's what this course is all about. An opportunity for you to think, perhaps to learn, and to make some judgments over what kind of a society you want. It's entirely likely that some of you rather favor the Fabian idea, are inclined to support some of the legislative measures that constitute this package. To you, I say this. Some of the most dedicated Americans have been Fabian socialists. My own pet, if that's the right word, is a great lady who died not too long ago, Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt. Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt taught me one thing in very marked terms. 
that if you've got the ideals, you, you must back them up with the courage of your convictions. In my home state of New York in the year of 1958, we saw a remarkable scene. We saw this woman approaching her 75th birthday, pushing doorbells in her election district of New York City. So if your instinct is toward those things, which Mrs. Roosevelt, which other people who are involved in the Fabian movement in the United States are for, then I say you have a responsibility to work as they've worked to make these things real. If, on the other hand, your concern is for your children, you want to maintain an opportunity system and a freedom system for them, then I think it's fairly obvious. You've got a job to do. And the job that you must do must be done in the precincts of your community. A great many of the people that I know who aren't disposed to accept the direction of our country now, who are opposed to socialism, say to me, the great problem is the alternative. You've said to us that man can't have liberty and live in a collectivized state. What is the alternative? Oh, there is one. Again, back to Shaw's observation, liberty means responsibility. I think we've seriously got to look at a, let's call it manifest of responsibilities. Where does the responsibility lie in the first instance for man's destiny? Well, in my opinion, if we are to be free men, we must begin, we must reconstruct our society so that we impose on the individual the pressures to sustain himself to the best of his ability. Now, we Americans, I think, are warm-hearted and humane. We recognize that there are people in our society who don't have the ability to sustain themselves, who are incapacitated, Aged, there are underprivileged children. Now, what of these? Well, Jefferson felt, and I agree, that the responsibility then passes to the family. Now, many people who feel that the family as a social unit in the United States has lost some of its meaning. Unfortunately, today, some of our people seem to believe that it isn't the job of parents to sustain their children. And there is among young people the idea that they don't have a responsibility toward their parents, particularly as they reach their latter years. I think if we want to be free men, we've got to get back to this family idea. But let's assume that we have a case here where neither individual nor family can sustain this problem. Where then? Well, I have a feeling that the church, the churches of America haven't quite played the role in our social structure that they might play. I have a quotation from Timothy 1. It has a great deal of meaning to me, and I commend it to you. If any provide not for his own, and especially those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Now, I don't know that I quite go along with Timothy to that point. Yet I feel that the church has a responsibility to aid in the social problems of our times. Now, what is the church? I know the reaction of many people is that the church is the preacher. But that's not quite the fact. 
We are the church. We as individuals, we as we contribute to the works of the church. All right. Let's still assume that we have a problem that can't be absorbed either through the individual's effort, through the family effort, or through the church effort. Where next the responsibility? Well, I commend to you the idea that perhaps local government has a function here. There's a problem here. Once upon a time in America, we absorbed our social problems through the local governmental mechanism. And in doing so, we created two dreadful specters the specter of the county poor farm, the specter of the county orphanage. We took human beings and literally stripped them of their dignity, threw them on a scrap heap. I don't think we can do that in the kind of lush society we're part of today. I think if we're going to do this job through the local community, we've got to do it in such a way that unfortunate human beings can still live in a manner of dignity manner of self-respect. After local government, in my judgment, the problem passes to the state governmental level. And only as a last resource to the central power of the federal government. In fact, under this formula, we would probably have a minimum of services necessary from federal government. And we'd have one thing guaranteed to us, a great deal less interference with our personal liberty. Now, I commend to you serious thought on this. If you want freedom, if human liberty is your end, a matter of accepting our personal responsibilities be beginning as individuals, remembering that we are our brother's keeper. What you're going to be talking about for the next several hours is this matter right here, which you have in front of you also in the classroom. And as you talk about this, you're going to come across one of the great problems of American politics at the present time. Probably some of you are among those who constitute this problem, and I don't mean to be offensive, but you independent voters do provide us with a considerable problem. And I'd like to spend a few minutes of your time discussing the role of the independent voter in American politics. The independent has been, I might even say, deified by the press, and given considerable attention by the academic political scientists. I'm not always sure that we know what we're talking about when we talk about independent voters. So far as I'm able to determine, there are two or three types of independent voter. Number one, the non-voter. By the non-voter, I mean that layer of potential voters between the figure that votes and those that don't. Badly explained, perhaps. But we have, let's say, 100 million potential voters in the United States, and we know that at tops we get out 65 million in any election. What about the other 35 million? Well, these are generally included among the independent voters. The second is what I would call the casual voter. And by casual, I mean this is the individual who votes in presidential elections and occasionally, perhaps, in gubernatorial elections when they're interesting enough to excite his attention. The third is perhaps the most problematical of the entire group, and I call him the crossover voter. And 
here's the fellow that provides us with our greatest amount of problem. Now, he's the man who says to you, well, I can't vote for the party. I like to vote for the man. His logic or lack of logic is worth examining. Before we do that, I'd like to read to you perhaps the best academic study that's been done on the independent voter, and particularly the crossover voter. It's a book called The American Voter, written by, compiled by, a group of political scientists from the Survey Research Center of Michigan, St Michigan University, Angus Camel, Philip Converse, Warren Miller, and Donald Stokes. The book is not a narrative so much as it is a collection of studies and surveys. And in referring to our friend, Mr. Crossover, they call the independent voter. Here's what they have to say. The ideal of the independent citizen, attentive to politics, concerned with the course of government, who weighs the rival appeals of a campaign and reaches a judgment that is unswayed by partisan prejudice, has had a vigorous history in the tradition of political reform. But the usual image of the independent voter is intended to be more than a normative ideal. Really, it fits poorly the characteristics of the independents in our samples. Far from being more attentive, interested, informed, independents tend as a group to be somewhat less involved in politics. They have a somewhat purer, poorer knowledge of the issues. Their image of the candidates is fainter. Their interest in the campaign is less. Their concern over the outcome is relatively slight. And their choice between competing candidates, although it is indeed made later in the campaign, seems much less to spring from discoverable evaluations of the elements of national politics. The independent voter. Now, here are the problems that he provides us with. First, whether he knows it or not, the fact is that you never vote for the man. You always vote for the organization or a faction of the organization. Organization meaning the party. The best way of explaining how and why is to simply say that no single individual today is competent, sufficiently to absorb all the problems that exist at the federal level, or for that matter, at most state levels. No one man can do the job of running the government of the United States or administering the government of the United States. No one man can do that job in the state of California or the state of Illinois or the state of New York. So, you really never vote for the man more often. Always, you're voting for the organization or a faction of the organization. Now, second facet, a second fallacy of the independent voter is his concept that if he votes for a, an administrator of one party and a legislator of the other, these tend to balance each other. These tend to assure him something. Really what they tend to assure him is hamstrung government. And the fact is that more often than not, he winds up paying bills for exactly that. Obstructionist government and hamstrung government. So it's for that reason that we commend to you the idea that you participate in a party, in a party process, that you work through that party to be effective in your self-interest you identify yourself with the party, you work through the committees of the party, you get to know the candidates of the party, and you have in the final analysis a channel of communications through which to reach the candidates of your party and hopefully those who are elected to government from your party.
You've been talking about politics for some time now. I hope you've learned something out of this. I hope the experience has been worthwhile. Yet it seems proper that something be said in summary to your discussions. I don't think anybody would try to involve you in politics for the mere fun of it, though I assure you it's a fun game in many ways. Rugged game, yes. Stakes are high. Going sometimes gets rough. But there's more to it than just the fun of it. What are the stakes? Well, I presume that all of you work hard at your jobs. You're interested in a number of things. In accumulating the goods to educate your children. In maintaining a decent standard of living for yourself and for saving something for your own latter years. Now the joker in the deck here is while you do this, while you work hard to acquire these things, those involved in politics are determining the very value of the fruits of your labor, your money. There are other stakes. The future of your children, your own destiny as a family. And last but not least, this, this quality that is so precious to us, your freedom. Word is used so frequently daily that we've almost taken the meaning out of it. It's a very precious thing, I hope, to we Americans. And not a quality that we ought to take for granted. Men have puzzled over this for many years, centuries. Perhaps you know that it was a considerable issue in the Constitutional Convention of 1789 when those great men gathered in Philadelphia to try to write a document that would bring order and sense to our government. In that convention, there was a great debate over whether or not man is competent to be free. How free should he be? How much right should be passed to him? The proponent of the idea that the human is capable of being free, the greatest single proponent was a man named Benjamin Franklin, one of my favorite characters in history who at that time was 80 years old. He fought the good fight in the convention and he won. And having won, Franklin moved forward and signed the document. And having signed it, he moved out onto dusty Chestnut Street on that bright, sunny afternoon. As the 80-year-old statesman reached the sidewalk, he noted a crowd of people. And out of the crowd there emerged a woman who said to him quite bluntly, Dr. Franklin, what kind of government have you given us? Franklin's answer is one of the profundities of all human history. He said, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. Now there are several schools of thought as to what Franklin meant. There are those who say, well, what could you expect but a blunt answer out of an 80-year-old man, tired and testy over this long, difficult experience. There are others who say, how typical of Franklin, how typical of poor Richard's almanac. But there's a third school of thought, and I commend this one to you. The people of this school feel that Franklin wrapped up the whole story of the American ideal right here. What he was saying was this. Lady, what we've done in here is not really very important. What we've done is to construct a blueprint under which man can be free. But this quality of human freedom must be won and re-won in every hour of every man's life. He must be responsible. 
I hope you'll think about that a little bit. And I'd like to offer you one other thought. I had an experience several years ago working in a community in southern part of the country. And the man who was to open the program came to me and he said, you know, Joe, I wasn't quite sure what I ought to say to impress on my associates how important I feel the subject of political participation is. And he said, I have a rather short statement to make, and I hope it does the program justice. What he said, I consider to be on the classic side, because he opened the program with his associates by saying this. Gentlemen, when little men begin to cast long shadows, the sun is setting on a civilization. This is a determination you must make, and having made it, next determine what you propose to do about it.